Good evening. It's great to see each of you once again for our midweek Bible study that we continue in the Gospel of Luke this evening. Uh, if you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to open them to chapter 7. We're going to be looking in the focal verses of verses 40 to 50 this evening. I hope you're managing to stay warm and cozy on these bitterly cold days, and I know you, you'll join me in praying for those in distant states who are not used to dealing with the cold, who have been battling power outages, and whose homes are are literally freezing in these days. Uh, let's remember them in our prayers this evening. Um, we jump ahead in our study from last week's lesson in Luke 6, where we saw Jesus having a couple of confrontational encounters with both the scribes and the Pharisees about the Sabbath day, to chapter 7. Uh, and again, our focal lesson this evening is in verses 40 to 50. But before we dive into that story about Jesus paying a visit to a home of a Pharisee, I want to call your attention briefly, at least, to the verses that lead up to that visit. The chapter opens with the statement that Jesus had finished his teaching, the Sermon on the Plain that we looked at several weeks ago, and he had returned to Capernaum. You know, I've been mentioning recently in several weeks that Capernaum was the base of Jesus' Galilean operations, where uh, his preaching and teaching ministry, uh, healing ministry, uh, extended out from that town. And it was interesting, and as I was doing some preparation for the Lenten studies that we begin today in Matthew's Gospel, I read this statement in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. Uh, now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee, and, leaves, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali. Uh, that passage really corroborates what we saw in, in Mark's gospel when we mentioned Jesus' healing of the paralytic. That uh, Mark 2, verse 1, we read that, that statement that it was heard that he was at home. And so Matthew's statement about him settling in Capernaum really confirms that this was Jesus' home and base of operation after he had left Nazareth. Uh, the following verses, verses 2 through 10 of Luke 7, uh, we read the story about Jesus healing the slave of a centurion. And once again, we see the remarkable grace of God being extended by Jesus to a non-Jewish person and an enemy of the Jews at that. The centurion would have been commanding troops of the occupying Roman army. But evidently, this guy's heart was in the right place because the Jewish elders of that community come and appeal to Jesus to save the life of this centurion's servant because he has shown kindness uh, toward them and even helped build their synagogue in town. And G as Jesus makes his way to the centurion's home, the man sends some friends to tell Jesus that uh, he is unworthy of the Lord entering into his home. And if he will just speak the word, he knows that his servant will be healed. Jesus pauses and publicly remarks to the crowd that's gathered around him, as there always was one, that he hasn't encountered such faith in all of Israel. And as those friends return to the centurion's home, they find that the servant has indeed been healed. Uh, Luke next reports that Jesus made his way to a town called Nain, N-A-I-N, and upon approaching it, he met a funeral procession for the only son of a widow lady. And Jesus approached that woman and told her not to weep, and then he reached out and touched the coffin, commanding the dead young man to rise up. This is another one of those remarkable instances where Jesus commands folks to do what is humanly impossible. And yet the young man did just that. He sat up in his coffin and began speaking to the amazement of the gathered crowd. Uh, the crowd's response was one of fear and glorifying God. It's a common response that we've seen to so many of the miracles of healing that Jesus had performed. And Luke records that they were saying, a great prophet has risen among us and God has visited his people. Uh, the following verses in a lengthy section, verses 18 through 35 of Luke chapter 7, describe a delegation that has, sent, has been sent by John the Baptist coming to inquire of Jesus if he indeed is the long-awaited Messiah. You know, we read that, and that question by John perhaps troubles us a bit. After all, he's, he's the forerunner who's been prophesied by Isaiah, who would go before the Messiah, announcing his coming. And he's, he's certainly done that. He even baptized Jesus. And perhaps we need to attribute the apparent doubt, or at least the second guessing, to the hardships that John had undoubtedly been experiencing after having been imprisoned by Herod. Jesus reassures John's followers that he is indeed the Messiah, and he points to the many miracles that he has accomplished. And Jesus goes on after these messengers of John have returned to 
deliver that message to him. And he sings John's praises. He says that there is no one born among women who is greater than John the Baptist. And the common folk who are there, the tax collectors and the commoners in that crowd, gladly affirm Jesus' words about John because they've received baptism at his hands. The Pharisees and the scribes who had not submitted to that baptism of repentance didn't welcome Jesus' words about John. And the immediate context for our focal passage begins in verse 36 with the statement that one of those Pharisees present in that crowd extended an invitation to Jesus to come and dine at his house. And that act is certainly remarkable. It's noteworthy, a bit surprising as well, given what we saw just last week about the Pharisees and the Herodians jointly plotting Jesus' death. But Jesus consents to the invitation and comes and attends the home of Simon, the, the Pharisee. Uh, what potentially could be an awkward situation turn, takes a turn for something even more bizarre and unsettling when an uninvited woman of the city who had a reputation as a sinner comes in and begins to wash Jesus' feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. And then she proceeds to anoint his feet with a costly vial of perfume. I want to pause just a second to clarify that while there is a similar incident that occurs near the end of Jesus' earthly life, I think these two events are strikingly different. There are a number of differences that would point to the fact that these aren't simply two uh, different reports of the same occurrence. The other occurrence takes place in the final week of Jesus' life at the home of Simon the leper. Uh, not Simon the Pharisee. And while the story we're looking at today occurred in early part of Jesus' ministry in Galilee, that second event happened in Bethany, just on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And John's gospel identifies the woman in the second incident as Mary, the sister of Lazarus. In the latter account also, Mary's specific purpose is, is stated as being anointing Jesus' body ahead of time before his crucifixion. Whereas in the current study that we're looking at this evening, the unnamed woman is acting out of gratitude and deep love for Jesus for his forgiveness of her sins. Now, verse 39 tells us that Simon the Pharisee was thinking or saying to himself that Jesus must not be a prophet of God or he would surely know what kind of person he is allowing to touch and approach him and even kiss his feet. And to be sure, this woman was violating all the accepted norms of first century Israel when it came to how women related to men. Uh, Simon's reaction is like what we saw earlier when Jesus dared to go into the home of Levi, accepting that invitation of a tax collector to dine with him and meet his friends. He just can't believe that, that uh, Jesus is accepting this woman's approach. Well, our focal lesson begins in verse 40, and it says that Jesus answered Simon, even though no specific question had been asked. And as we've repeatedly observed, no verbal words needed to be spoken for Jesus to know the thoughts of a person's heart. And Jesus' initial words to Simon don't appear to be confrontational. He just announces to Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon may have been anticipating Jesus was going to share some nugget of spiritual truth with him, but he goes ahead and invites Jesus with this uh, statement, say it, teacher, uh, at least communicating uh, a degree of respect for the Lord at this point. Jesus proceeds in verses 41 to 42 to tell a story to drive home a point that he wants to make with Simon. He speaks of a creditor who was owed money by two different debtors. Both owed significant amounts of money, but the debt of one far surpassed any reasonable expectation of being able to repay it. This man owed 500 denarii, uh, while the second man owed 50. Now, both quantities were significant because a denarius represented a day's work. So even the debt of 50 denarii was the equivalent of almost two months of salary. The debt of 500 denarii, on the other hand, was the salary of 83 weeks, if we're talking about a six-day work week with a day off for the Sabbath. That represented more than a year and a half's wages. In verse 42, Jesus tells us that neither man was able to repay the debt he owed to the creditor, but unexpectedly and kind of like a gift out of the blue, the creditor graciously forgave and wrote off the debt of each man. And the emphasis in Jesus' word is on the completely undeserved nature of the creditor's act in pardoning and forgiving the debts that these men owed him. Clear reminder as well for us that we are all utterly undeserving of the grace of God that he so freely chooses to extend to us. Jesus concludes the story by asking Simon which of the two men would, would be more likely to love this creditor who had forgiven and canceled out 
their indebtedness. And it's clear from Jesus' question that he wants Simon to reflect on the obvious truth that he's making by telling this story. Simon's response is a bit halting, noncommittal. It's almost like he's hedging his bets. He answers in verse 43, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And while that answer is half-hearted at best, Jesus commends him for having reached the right conclusion. He declares, you have judged correctly. And we can safely assume that the man who was forgiven the greater debt of 500 denarii, a debt, as I mentioned, that would be impossible to expect uh, to be able to repay, would feel a greater love and gratitude to the one who had taken away that immense burden of indebtedness. In verses 44 to 46, Jesus redirects the conversation with his host, Simon, to the woman who has so shockingly made her way into this dinner setting uninvited. Jesus asks Simon a probing question whose answer exists really on multiple levels. He asks him, do you see this woman? (laughs) On one level, of course, it would be impossible not to see her. After all, she's interrupted this dinner gathering, uninvited. She's, She's made a commotion, undoubtedly, by her actions of, of, of washing Jesus' feet with her tears and uh, probably generated a lot of whispers among the crowd who's watching her actions. But on a deeper level, Jesus' question penetrates all of our hearts, asking us to consider whether or not we really do see the needs of those around us. Jesus goes on in these verses to draw a sharp contrast between how Simon, as the host, had treated Jesus and how this woman had demonstrated her love for him by her actions. Simon had failed at one of the most basic duties of hospitality by failing to provide Jesus for water with water to wash his feet when he entered the home. Walking the dusty roads of Galilee in those days uh, would have necessitated washing your feet when you arrived and, and entered into your home. And Simon hadn't taken care of this duty nor assigned a servant to do so. In contrast, Jesus says this woman washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. What a striking depiction and and picture of her humility as well as her role in society as an outcast, given the earlier statement about her being a a known sinner. She wouldn't have felt the freedom, of course, to ask Simon, the host, for a towel to use to dry Jesus' feet, so she made use of what she had, her hair. Jesus goes on to indicate Simon likewise had failed at another basic level of hospitality by failing to greet Jesus with a kiss when he entered the home. You know, I I know sometimes we, in the 21st century, joke in our culture about the biblical command to greet one another with a holy kiss. That seems like a bridge too far for us, but that was an acceptable and an expected practice in ancient Israel and in the Middle East, and in fact, in many parts of the the world today. I've shared with many of you uh, from our experience as missionaries in Argentina, that was a common practice. When you walked into a church gathering, you greeted everybody with a kiss on the cheek. It's kind of an air kiss, cheek to cheek. Uh, sometimes, depending on the part of the country, it was a double uh, kiss, one on each cheek. Uh, Jesus tells Simon he didn't greet him with a kiss when he entered the home, but this woman had not ceased to kiss his feet since he came into the house. And we see again her humility in this action that went far beyond any normal expectation of demonstrating hospitality or love. And as a a final contrast between Simon's lack of hospitality and this woman's demonstration of extravagant love, Jesus says in verse 46 that Simon hadn't anointed his head with oil, but the woman had anointed his feet with a costly perfume. Now, the act of anointing the head of a guest wasn't a typical part of receiving a guest, but it certainly would have been an indication that this person was deemed as someone deserving of of ultimate respect and and high esteem. Simon didn't view Jesus with that kind of respect at all, but this woman, having washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair, proceeds to anoint them with a costly perfume. And her actions do, of course, remind us of the later extravagant act of Mary of Bethany in anointing Jesus' body before his crucifixion. Jesus' next words are directed once again at Simon in verse 47. He prefaces his remark with a a phrase designed to make sure his host is listening and paying attention. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you. And his next words were undoubtedly shocking to Simon as he tells his dinner host that this woman's sins, though many, have been forgiven. Jesus' statement would erase any doubt that Simon might have had about whether or not Jesus knew about this woman's sinful nature. He, he clearly did. 
He acknowledges, nevertheless, that her sins have been forgiven because she has shown great love. Just like the, the man in the parable uh, or the story who, whose huge indebtedness had been pardoned and who loved greatly this creditor. Now, some speculate that Jesus may have had a previous encounter with this woman, at which time he forgave her of her sins. But verse 48 would indicate that it's at this moment, precisely, that he is pronouncing her sins forgiven. Whatever the actual exact timing of her forgiveness, the key point, of course, is that the earlier story that he told and now her actions are a demonstration that forgiveness has been greeted by an amazing outpouring of loving acts of gratitude. Almost as an aside at this point, but certainly an important part of the account, Jesus goes on to say that the one who has been forgiven little loves little. I think it's probable that Jesus makes that statement with reference to his host, Simon. And I don't mean by that that Simon has an equally sinned or is somehow less in need of forgiveness than the woman was. The, the pride and judgmentalism that he demonstrates in this story are clear indicators that he is equally, if not more, in need of forgiveness for his sins than this woman. His lack of recognition of his own need for repentance and the accompanying love and gratitude that would ensue from that is going to be an experience he doesn't get to enjoy because of his failure to acknowledge his own sinfulness. This statement obviously too reminds us of Jesus's early declaration that we saw a couple of weeks ago in Luke 5:32, when he said he hadn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Again, that isn't saying that there are righteous people who don't need to repent. Simply, there are self-righteous persons who fail to see their need to repent and receive the forgiveness of God. Well, Luke next introduces us, at least as an aside, to the un to the invited guests who are reclining at table there, uh, sharing the meal along with Jesus. There's no indication, of course, that Jesus' disciples had been included among the dinner guests, and the reaction of these guests indicate that they were friends of Simon, and they shared their host view of Jesus and his disciples. Not a very uh, uh, positive view at that. They begin muttering among themselves, and they ask the same question that has been voiced by so many of Jesus' opponents and his detractors. Who is this man who even forgives sins? Like so many of the religious leaders we've previously encountered in the Gospels, they simply cannot tolerate or accept Jesus' claim to be able to forgive the sins of others. Now, Luke concludes this chapter by recording Jesus' parting words to the woman who has shown such love, devotion, and gratitude to him. Speaking directly to her, Jesus says, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. While there's no specific mention in the, this passage of the, ver, of the woman verbally affirming her faith and trust in Christ, her actions clearly demonstrated that she is trusting in him alone with no pretense about any righteousness that she herself might possess. Her reputation as a sinful woman had reduced her to the point of utter dependence on the grace of God for any hope of being restored to a new life. And Jesus recognizes that quality of faith in her and pronounces her not only forgiven of her sins, but saved. And beyond that reassuring word that she has passed from death into life, she's experienced salvation through her faith in Christ, Jesus further instructs the woman to go in peace. That statement carries with it a message of hope for her future, freed from the guilt of whatever sinful actions and lifestyle she had previously been engaged in. We can never experience the peace of God in our hearts and lives until we've made peace with God through our faith in Christ, through salvation. Jesus' words to this woman point to her having experienced God's grace that day in a transformative way. And now her future points to a brighter day as she's led by the Spirit of God. An amazing encounter in which we see once again God's grace acting in the life of this individual. I invite you to pray with me as we conclude our, our study this evening. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your amazing grace. Uh, we are so undeserving of that, and yet you choose to shower it so mercifully and richly upon us. Thank you for the gift forgiveness of our sins that we've experienced by placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. Pray that if there's anyone who's listening to this study this evening who's never made that, that step of faith, never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, that Today might be the day of victory for them in their own lives. Bless us this week as we uh, work, as we labor, as we rest, as we go through our life and help us to point others to the saving grace of Jesus. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name.
God bless you all. Hope to see you Sunday morning online or those of you brave enough to venture out into the cold in person. God bless you.